Hey, what's up? This is Dave Mira, and you're listening to The Expansion Project. Welcome to another episode of The Expansion Project Podcast. I'm your host, Fat Tony, and on this show, I have casual yet deep conversations with professional athletes, entrepreneurs, coaches, investors, authors, bloggers, musicians, and anybody that I find to be really interesting or successful. Now, why do I have these conversations? Well, the hopes is to expand my mind and yours while motivating and inspiring people along the way. On this episode, I got to talk to TJ Lavin. TJ is a former professional BMX rider who has two X Games gold medals and was very influential in the 90s. In October of 2010, he actually had a crash at the Dutour at his, in his hometown of Las Vegas where he went into a coma. After he got out of the coma, he had to relearn how to walk, relearn how to count, uh, pretty much relearn how to do everything he needed to do to be a functioning human still. Um, but even with that setback, he has hosted 17 seasons of MTV shows, uh, The Challenge and Real World Road Rules Challenge, and he's about to film his 18th season coming up. He's also a very talented musician. He's been playing the piano for many, many years. He is a dedicated and loving husband and father. And of course, you know what I'm interested in. He's a great entrepreneur and investor. So in our conversation, I got to ask TJ all about his investment deals. Uh, he told me about some of the good ones and some of the bad ones and sort of what he learned along the way. One thing that surfaced, though, was just his extreme desire to want to help other people. Uh, this manifests itself um, through his wealth and his financial success, but also just his uh, his drive and motivation. He's actually about to become a firefighter, and even though he doesn't need the money, he wants to do this just to be able to help people. So that really says a lot about his character. So I was a huge TJ Lavin fan before this conversation, and I left uh, even a bigger fan. He just made a really big impression on me, and uh, he's just a great guy, and you're going to learn a lot from this episode. Before I bring on the guest, let me get a few of the pre-plugs out of the way. If you like what you hear and you want to help out, please tell a friend, post it on your social networks, spread the word however you can. Also, subscribe to the show either on iTunes or Stitcher and download all the episodes as they come in. There's a new episode dropping every Tuesday. Also, you can give five-star ratings on iTunes and then go ahead and leave a review on iTunes as well. Now, the review is going to help other people find the show and get it bumped up in the iTunes ratings. This week, a review came in from somebody that didn't leave a name, but they said, Fat Show keeps you wanting more. Topics like money, eating healthy, fitness, personal experiences, and BMX, dot, dot, dot. For a fairly new show, Fat has a great recipe to make this a success. I just subscribed and look forward to what comes next. So thanks to whoever wrote that. And again, if you guys want to leave a review, I'll give you a shout out and read some of the best reviews here on the show. Also, you can go check out the company that's been hooking me up with some really good proteins and supplements, Nutrasuma, that's N-U-T-R-A-S-U-M-M-A.com, and you can use the promo code FATTONY1 for 20% off all your stuff. I use their pea protein that's vegan friendly. I also use their creatine and amino acids and their super green supplement. So again, that's Nutrasuma.com, promo code FATTONY1 for 20% off. Now, without further ado, I will welcome to the show my guest today, TJ Lavin. TJ, thank you so much for making the time. Yeah, no worries, man. So let's catch up for a few minutes. Uh, I know you've been kind of traveling all over the place, and uh, you recently went on a Bikes Over Baghdad tour. So give me a quick update on where you've been and uh, maybe a little bit about that tour. Yeah, the, the Bikes Over Baghdad tour was a, was a dream of mine forever. And Nate Wessel came over and helped me build some stairs for my loft in my garage. And... and when he was over here, I was like, listen, man, if there's ever any room on, on bikes over back that, I want to be a part of it. And so, sure enough, there was room, and then he called me, and, and my answer was yes, instantly. And uh, it was it, it kind of freaked me out. Like, it was it was crazy, like, to say yes right away, and, and we're just going for it. And then I, I canceled a couple appointments, and, and now I'm going to, to bikes over back that, and I have no idea where we were going, what we were doing. And I just knew that we were doing shows for the troops, and I knew that it would be badass, and that I had to go. So, um, so we did that, and and honest to God, like my biggest fear was flying coach all that way. Like that was good. As it was, good. <laughs> I was like, damn, that's far, man. That's that's a far trip for this broken old body. But uh, it worked out sweet. It was awesome having friends there and stuff like that. And so I rode BMX again for a while, and it was 
it was amazing. So just to fill in the listeners, um, Bikes Over Baghdad is basically a tour or a trip where a bunch of BMX riders go overseas and perform for the troops that are stationed in undisclosed locations all around the world. Um, and they've done a handful of these things. And there, there's actually been some cool documentaries and stuff. And every time riders come back from that trip, I always see people posting on, on social networks or hear them talking about just how impactful it was to to be able to perform for the troops and just kind of be a part of that, you know? Um, so it's yeah, super cool it was, that you got to do that. It was a really good feeling, and uh, and and the people were 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 really cool, and they're just like you and I, like they're just out there in the middle of nowhere, and they're they're, you know, stuck out there half the time, and they're like, man, damn, I'm, it feels so good that you guys came out here and, and did this for us, you know. It was it was really a great feeling, and so I, I'm down to go back again, you know. I'm down to do it again for sure because we did four different countries. We did it in Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and Djibouti, and Africa. And so, like, Djibouti, Africa, like, is no man's land. Like, those guys are in, in, in basically, you know, a pretty gnarly camp, and that's about it. You know, they can't really leave or anything and go see the place and, and, and experience with the locals and stuff like that. It's, it's very um, isolated. So. Mm-hmm. To have people come in and see them is way, way better. So I think it's really cool. and It's definitely a service. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm definitely jealous. Every time I see all the photos and hear the stories and stuff, it's like, damn, that that just must be an incredible experience. Um, I I also heard, if I'm not mistaken, did you do your first backflip since your big crash on that trip? Yeah, yeah, like on a hard surface for sure. Um, I've done a couple backflips on the resi, of course, but... Uh, yeah, we, we got all hyped up, man. We were in Qatar, I think. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Qatar or Bahrain. But either way, we were very, very, um, amped up. And we we're under this thing called the, the bra. So that must have been Qatar, I think. And so, so we we're under the bra. And, and that's where we did the shows. So when people would yell and scream, it would like echo in there. So it was a very electric atmosphere. And so when we went and did it, Everybody was going off, and I saw guys doing stuff that just really shouldn't have been done on a bike. <laughs> These guys are killing it, and you know we're with the best riders in the world. Like, I mean, you can't compare to what these dudes are doing, you know. So I, I couldn't, and and so I didn't try to. I just went out there, did muddle whips, and had fun, and did a couple no handers and things like that. And I was like, man, I'm gonna flip this box. And so I went and did it, and it was it was sick. I crashed the first one because it was the first one I did, and it looped me out. It was super fast, and I was like, "Wow!" So I still had that 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 natural ability to jump off because I felt like I was going too fast, mm-hmm. and and felt like I was looping out. So um, I got out of it, and then I instantly got up real quick and and wanted to send it again and slow it down a little bit. Dude, that's incredible. How did that feel when you? Uh... I mean, obviously, it's a pretty big milestone for you coming back after that injury and everything. Yeah, it felt it felt awesome. I mean, the whole tour felt awesome. Like every every show, I got to I learned a new trick, you know. So mm. it was crazy because it, it was like just falling back in love with with an old friend. It was awesome. That's cool, man. So, how much do you actually ride these days? And is your backyard uh, dirt jump setup still going? Yeah, the backyard dirt jumps are still there, but I don't really touch it too much, to be honest. I mean, once in a while, like, we'll go on a spurt and we'll, we'll, we'll do, like, a whole week of riding, you know, but, and then sometimes it'll be, like, three or four weeks before we ever touch it again. And then we'll go on another, like, eight, ten days in a row, me and Slayer. And, and basically it's only him and I, you know, my buddy Slayer. So, so we, we don't really do anything else, you know, if we, if we ride, together then then we're you know we're loving it but i see him out there if he if he's riding then i'll ride mm-hmm. a lot of times but if he's not riding i really don't go out there alone or nothing yeah yeah is there any other place that you would ride besides the yard or you just pretty much stick to the yard no i i pretty much stick to the yard i mean i i i would ride like at, at uh, different different spots or whatever but uh to be honest, I'm just so busy and so so tied up with things that that I don't really have the time to, to load up the bike, go do the thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's like if it's if it's there and it's convenient, I'll do it. 
Mm-hmm. But if it's not, then then I probably won't. Yeah. Speaking of your time frame and your schedule, dude, I've got to ask this. You post on Instagram at the most outrageous hours, and it seems like you just don't sleep. What is your sleep schedule like? Yeah, my sleep schedule is crazy because a lot of times I start getting tired at like seven thirty, eight thirty at night, <laughs> and I'm still doing something wherever I'm at. You know, whatever I'm doing, I'm like, damn. So I got, I got to shut this down. So I go home and and I'm I'm sleeping. I'm hoping to sleep by nine, nine thirty. Mm-hmm. 10 at the very latest, but I'm usually up until about 10 or 11. And then my body clock just wakes me up at 3 and 4 in the morning. So Damn. every day, doesn't matter what day it is, how it is, whatever. So it drives my wife crazy, and I think that eventually she'll leave me for this. But <laughs> she, it's just part of it, man. It's crazy. Wow. Damn, yeah. I, I thought uh, it must have been just your crazy motivation or drive, but... Uh, Sounds like it might just be your internal mechanisms that are waking you up, huh? Yeah, man. Like, it, it, like I, I think of crazy things at, in the middle of the night sometimes. And so, if you think of anything crazy, then then you're in trouble. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. if I start thinking like, okay, I could do this or I could do that or whatever, then it's it's instantly in my mind, and I cannot fall back asleep no mm-hmm. matter what. Mm-hmm. So. That, that internal mechanism is for sure there. And I think that came from traveling so much and being in South America a lot and, and things like that in Australia and different places, like being overseas and, and all these places, I never, like, adjusted my clock perfect mm-hmm. when I got home from that. So mm. it permanently made me, like, wake up, you know, at certain crazy hours. Yeah. So when, you, when you're talking about thinking of crazy things at night, that's kind of ideas or, or inspiration stuff, like business-type things? Is that yeah, what you're yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, ideas, like just different ideas. Like if I did this, I could do that, or if I did this, I could do that, mm-hmm. or maybe I could fix this or make that or whatever, you know. So it's it, it could be anything from like something as trivial as getting a whiteboard for our, for our gym in the shop mm-hmm. or getting uh, or ha- how to hang the bike in the loft or – you know, something like that, like mm-hmm. some silly, or or how can I get forgiven off the ground, like better, or how can I make pork, you know, sell more, you know, it's like different things like that, like really, it's hard to sleep. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so you just mentioned a whiteboard in the garage gym, and I definitely wanted to ask you about that. Um, so I know for a while you were doing CrossFit style workouts. Um, are you still training like that? Yeah, yeah, every day. Nice. And how did that come about exactly? My friend Sean had a, a, a rig in his house, at his house, in his backyard. And we would go over there every day. And that's who introduced me to that style workout. And I was like, huh, I like this. It's fast. It's quick. It's very, very hard. And uh, I need to be a part of this. So so I I just started going over there a lot and and working out every day. And then he got himself a bigger crazy rig and was getting rid of this one. And my wife just so happened to be um, training and, and be, being a trainer. So I'm like, she's training people. She, she needs a rig. I, I, so I have a garage with a lot of empty space, so I might as well help her. Mm-hmm. So I put that rig in the shop, and then I surprised her for her birthday, and she was stoked. So then, like, one of her friends is a really cool chick and she's she's like oh let's start doing workouts so we did and now it's going good it's really cool that's Having awesome everybody over here to work out with us and stuff like that it's fun so uh, do you actually consider yourself uh kind of in the crossfit community like do you look at actual crossfit named workouts or follow like the you know sport of crossfit or do you sort of do just other high intense interval training type things on somebody else's program that's not necessarily considered to be crossfit proper no, it's not CrossFit. It's it's it, it's like yeah, we're 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 different for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, like just 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 high intensity workouts is basically what it is. We're not like a part of the community or anything like that. But they they're they're uh, not that there's anything against it. Those guys are gnarly. Mm-hmm. But I just don't. We don't have that kind of drive and that kind of time and that kind of stuff to make it happen. But mm-hmm. uh, our our. Uh, our, our workouts are really cool, very humble, very, you know, it's good. Yeah. And where do you get the workouts from or who programs those for you? 
Um, she, my partner Chelsea, she does it. Um, she she like looks up. She comes from a volleyball, volleyball background, so we do a lot of volleyball stuff too. Mm-hmm. Um, we do like a lot of volleyball, like uh, like box jumps and stuff like that. Like they come from different sports, mm-hmm. so so she does that. We have a pro hockey player that comes here, pro baseball player, like different you know dudes come to stay in shape. Nice, very cool. So well, we're gonna... they also they all pitch in different workouts and stuff that they do too. You know, so so we. We use a lot of different workouts um, that that some of those people use as well. You know, like yeah. hockey players, uh, there's certain you know like skaters and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. it, it's 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 really a good good community. That's awesome, man. Um, so let's go yeah. ahead and switch gears, and we're going to get into the business end of the conversation here. Um, so I'm going to preface a lot of this uh, with a little story. So you know, I was always a big fan of yours through you know my early days of writing and stuff. Um, And as I got older, uh, one of the things that I really kind of admired is uh, just the way you carried yourself. Um, But one of the things that really intrigued me about your business life specifically was that after you had your big crash, um, it seemed like you kind of went a different approach than what other people did when they crashed. Because, you know, there's been other sort of high profile guys within the BMX community um, or other just BMX riders that maybe aren't as high profile that have had these big crashes where they stacked up medical bills. And, you know, the, the BMX community kind of rallies together and, you know, puts on benefits and jams and tries to do a little fundraisers and stuff, which I think is cool and noble. But as an outsider looking at your situation, after you, you know, crashed, went into a coma, had loads of medical bills, I assume, it seemed like you were right back at it of like launching a company and, you know, going, you know, get TV gigs or hosting gigs and stuff like that. And it was like you didn't skip a beat. Um, obviously you had to, you know, relearn how to count and tie your shoes and, and walk and all these crazy things. But as soon as you were back to functioning, you were like back to business and you weren't kind of asking other people for money. And not that I'm, you know, judging that aspect of other people and how they did things, but as a business side, I thought that was really, really cool to see that you were just going after it, you know? Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I, I, I really can't take credit for that. Um, like Dana White uh, threw a benefit for me, so when I woke up, like Dana White is throwing a party for me, and and he's a friend of mine, he's a really nice guy, and and him and Lorenzo and all these dudes that have have to do with the UFC do this benefit for me, and they raised a bunch of money for me, so that was that was why, like I was able to help so many people because I had way too much money left over Hmm. for for my medical bills, you know? Mm -hmm. So every penny that I had left over, I donated to different people that were hurt, like whether whether it was somebody that was like, like this kid Paul Thacker donated some money or donated a, uh, uh, like a panel, I think, to a snowmobile or a helmet or something, and then another guy donated whatever. But Paul Thacker got paralyzed himself that November Hmm. after my exact, which was October, so I gave him twenty grand, and then the next guy got, you know, like he broke his back. A good friend of mine, Gary Laurent, broke his back, so I had to give him ten grand, like just to help him out with his bills and stuff like that. Because just because you have health insurance doesn't mean your house bills and stuff stop, you know. Mm-hmm. So like, like I helped him out, and then Steve Murray needed some money for the uh, for the down payment on his house, um, so I helped out with that, and then like different people, and then that kid Ty. He crashed in my backyard. Mm-hmm. He crashed the, the night before me, and so I was able to split the money that they raised with him straight across. Mm-hmm. So, so it was like, and whatever money I had left over from my medical bills, I donated. So it was, it was a really good thing, you that's know. Awesome. And that that was just a really cool thing that that I was able to do because of of either the people I knew or or how. It, it just all worked out, you know? Yeah. So how much money did that benefit that Dana White put on raised then? It seems like it must have been a decent amount. Yeah, I think it was 500000 Oh, shit. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. And so and my bills were $2.5 million or $2.4 million, mm-hmm. but I have health insurance. So my portion of it was like two hundred grand, maybe or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then so I, I got to just donate the rest. Wow, that's great, man. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit, actually, and uh, and tell another quick story. Um, I don't know if I've told you this before. I, I feel like maybe I have, but 
Um, since you mentioned Ty and stuff, the night that you crashed at Dutour, um, I remember being up on the roll in and, uh, you know, your buddy Ty had crashed the night before. Um, and I was up on the roll in and I just kind of, you know, was like, Hey man, how's it going? You know, like kind of, obviously I know that your friend's in a coma right now. Like that must be tough for you. So I just asked you how you were doing and you basically were like, dude, I don't even feel like I should be here right now. Like I feel off. I feel weird. Like this doesn't feel right. My buddy's in the hospital and like, this just doesn't feel right being up on this roll in right now. And like 20 minutes later, you tried a trick that you'd done a million times and you crashed, you know? Um, so for me, yeah, that, that yeah. was a pretty bizarre moment, you know? Yeah, it's pretty crazy, dude. You can't write it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, no one would believe it. <laughs> yeah. If you wanted to make a movie out of it, no one would believe it. Right. And I was telling everybody that day, like, I'm I'm just over contest. Like, I really don't want to be in contest anymore. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't feel fun right now today you know because i was so upset about ty mm -hmm. and then um and then then yeah like not even 24 hours later i'm i'm laying in the bed next to him and we're both on life support that's pretty rough yeah and it, it kind of is a big testament too to how mental sports and athletics is you know i mean you yeah, physically you were, you were there mental. like physically you know how to do that trick but if you're not there mentally man you could just fuck up on the smallest thing yeah it's done you're done all right, so let's go back to, to some business stuff. Um, have you ever actually had a quote-unquote regular job? Um, yeah, when I was 16, I was a, I was a runner um, at a nuts and bolts factory. So that was a, a little bit of a regular job. My first job that I ever had when I was 15, I was 15 and a half, and I got a work permit to go get a job at an ice cream shop. So I worked at an ice cream shop for a minute, and that was just so I could save up and buy a car so I could make it to the trails. Mm -hmm. Nice. So it, so, so by saying that, getting a work permit at, at 15 and a half, that kind of right there already shows me that you had a, a drive and a motor to get shit done even as a, a young kid. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and the thing is, is like that at $4.25 an hour, I would have never gotten that car if it wasn't for my mom. So she, she, she just bit the bullet, but she just wanted to see how much I wanted to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and how much I wanted that car. So she could see, you know, she, she like just, just bought me the truck. It was $6,000. I'll never forget it. It was a 91 Chevy S10 and something that I'll never forget. Like she just went and sent it, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, and she was like a lady that made 30 grand a year. She didn't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think, you know, after you, after, you know, your short stint with uh, regular jobs was over. You know, you became a professional BMX rider and you didn't have to work uh, these traditional type jobs. Do you think that life as a pro rider gave you sort of a taste for what it's like to not be in an employee position? Because as it looks r like right now, you know, you're, you have your hand in so many different things with the TV hosting and, uh, you know, different investments and companies and stuff. It seems like, you know, you're never going to be an actual employee again like you were when you were young. So do you think, you know, living life as a pro rider sets you up for that? Well, you, you, you would think that, that a guy would be cool not being an employee, but I, I really miss the team of the team aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Like depends on what job you're having, you know? Like I'm I'm currently applying for a firefighter position because it's something that I've always wanted to do and it's something that I long for. Mm -hmm. Like I, I love the the camaraderie that we have on the deck of a BMX contest. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's friends, everybody's family. And basically we all have the, the most, the utmost respect for each other because we know that that run could be your last. And it was my last at one point mm -hmm. and it was Matthew's last at one point. And everybody else that's on that deck at some point is going to take slams. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. even somebody as, as, as amazing, you know, as all these new kids that are coming up, they know in their heart of hearts that, that at some point they're going to take a pretty hard slam mm -hmm. so they all have such respect for each other that i long for that and and we're all like-minded individuals as well so i look at different professions and different things that i could do because yeah i've been doing like stuff for myself and and things for myself and doing whatever i wanted to forever but i think you know for the last 25 years to be honest like i've been just doing whatever i want to do and and however i want to do it and it's, it's been incredible but that that structure and that stability and that that um, family atmosphere 
that I really long for, like with with the being being an athlete and stuff, like that. I I find that in the fire department, you mm-hmm. know, and that's something that because I work out with firefighters, and that's how I even, you know, came around to the to the fire thing. Like I, I worked out with them a long, long time ago, probably 15 years ago. And, and when I was a little baby, I wanted to be a firefighter, but that was just, you know, little kid stuff. Like okay. all little kids want to do it. Right. But then I worked out when I was in, in my early twenties and, and I loved the guys. And I was like, man, I'm going to become a firefighter one day. And they were like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And then when I was in my thirties, I was like, Hey man, what's up with the fire department? How is it? How's it going? How is it? And they were like, you know what, man, you should test. <laughs> you, you are a firefighter. Like, you're the guy, you know, you're better than me. Like the dude was telling me, you know, like <laughs> you're more of a firefighter than I am and you should do it. Like you pull over to help people and, and take people for rides and whatever, like, like all day, every day. And I'm like, man, I just, I really want to do it. You know, I really want to be part of that program. You guys are bad. And he was like, you won't really do it. And I was like, yeah, man, serious. Like, you know, I'd love to. And so I had a captain of, of city, a friend of mine um, come out to Thailand when I was out there filming. So he came out and then he said it at the same time. He's like, look, dude, like, I don't know why you don't test. You're, you're right there. Like, you're awesome. Like you should do this. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'll do it when I get home. And he was like, yeah, right. And that said, no, I'm, I'm doing it. Look up an EMT class for me. Cause that's a prerequisite. Mm-hmm. I already knew that. And so he did. And then I came home and I started an ENT class that Monday, nice. which is two years ago. Um, and so I, I I went to EMT school, graduated from that in second place. So uh, I, I did really well. And then um, and then I, I tried out for the city fire department and I made it all the way to the end. So I went through all the interviews, all the backgrounds, all the, all the lie detector tests that you could ever take, a thousand questions psych test, everything you can imagine, I did. And I made it all the way to the end, got some turnouts with my name on them and everything. Like, and and all of a sudden, we got clipped because they brought in some laterals from Reno. Mm-hmm. So they were they were taking care of their own, which was very attractive as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's something that you, if you think about it, like I don't want to take somebody's job. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to take the dude's job. Like I'm not trying to come in here and Captain save a do a job, you know, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be part of the community. Like there's yeah. no doubt about it. I want to help people. I want to be a professional people helper, you know? Mm-hmm. And they were like, they were like, okay, so let's just test again. And I said, okay, no problem. So then this test came around in October and it was for five different departments here in Vegas. There's a new thing that they got going on. And when they did that, I took that and I did really well. And, um, and then I just, I just got a call back from that right now, which was for, um, Henderson fire, which is right here in Vegas. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty badass, man. Like, and I made it to the, to the chief solo board, which is a big deal. And they, we got along great. So now I'm currently waiting for a call from the chiefs of Henderson fire. And I'm really hoping to get on there. Nice. So is, is that kind of a thing you're waiting like any day now that could pop up or any minute now? Yeah. 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 Any day now, like they, 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 they'll call if, if I make it, you know, mm-hmm. if I made it, you know, if I'm the guy then the, that they're looking for, then I'll, I'll be there, man. It's yeah. crazy. Like it's, it's crazy to think that, but it's even crazier to like think that like I'm almost at the end of that journey. Like it's such a big deal, dude. Mm-hmm. Like to get to, where I've gotten is awesome, but man, to, to really, to really do it is going to be a whole different level of cool. Yeah. Damn. So, so many follow-up questions here that, uh, I don't even know where to start. So, I mean, again, as an outsider looking in, um, it seems like this is something that you don't really need the money for, right? I mean, this is solely just because you want to do this and you want to help people. Is that right? Yeah. That's sick, man. Um, and you know, I, the, the whole aspect of the community thing and, and working with people, that really resonates with me a lot. You know, I worked for Ride BMX Magazine for a bunch of years, and even though, you know, there was three guys that ran the magazine, I really did feel like, for the most part, I was running the website by myself. 
Um, and you know, there were some corporate people that looked at analytics and shit here and there. And, you know, they would help me out with things, but it did feel like I was very much working alone. And, and when I went to competitions, yeah, there was, you know, people out there, but I wasn't working with a team. You know what I mean? I shot the photos. I edited the photos. I did the video. I posted everything. It was kind of a one man show. And now I've kind of switched over and I've been doing a lot of stuff within, uh, you know, the CrossFit industry and, there's like a team of photographers that work together and hand off photos to an editor. And, you know, we kind of collaborate on things and, you know, one person says, okay, I'm going to cover this part. You cover this part. And, um, even that little bit of teamwork right there makes me feel like I'm a part of something bigger. And, and it's really cool to have that just, like you said, community vibe or just those people relationships that you, you might miss out on if you're just kind of doing everything solo, you know? So, yeah. And like, it's like-minded individuals too. Like, you know, that's something that, 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 all firefighters that I've met have have really wanted to help. They're really quick to help, mm-hmm. and they're they're very quick to help people too. Like like when when we were working out one day, um, there was a, a a scream in the backyard, and there was you know eight firefighters and me working out, mm-hmm. and I couldn't believe that that how fast all eight of those guys ran back there prepared to do whatever they had to do to, to, to mitigate the situation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I loved that. I was like, dude, that is, they're quick to help. You know, I'm like, that's, that's the kind of people that I want to be around. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that, that really like it. I mean, I, I was already sold on the firefighter thing, but now I'm really, really sold on it you know yeah that's something that i really want to be a part of like when a dude is that quick to help that tells me that he's the right kind of guy Mm -hmm. you know very cool um so let's go back so uh like you said you you definitely had this drive as a, a young kid um and that still carries through everything you do today um Back then when you were a kid, you know, you said your your mom didn't make a lot of money and you were making very little money. Um, were you kind of a savvy, you know, business minded person even when you were young like that? And I kind of preface yeah. this by saying, you know, I was that way when I was a kid. You know, I used to, you know, try to sell little things at school and, you know, save and manage my money when I was a little kid and stuff. So Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, when I was a little kid, I, I would I would definitely manage to, to do a lot of business deals and things like that at school. Like I, I sold gum and my mom would help me buy the gum, you know, at school or before I went to school, she, she would help me buy buying me $5 worth of gum. So that was, that was five packs of gum. And then I would sell those packs of gum at school. Uh, no, no, it was, it was for, uh, I think the gum was 25 cents for a pack at the time mm-hmm. back in the day. This is like, I don't know, this might be before your time, Tony. I'm not <laughs> sure, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But the, they're uh, they they were selling these packs of gum, these little packs of gum for for I think 25 cents, and I would sell them for a dollar. And so so I would get a dollar, like I was making 75 cents a pack mm-hmm. because they were getting sold at school. So that's when I realized that location was everything because nobody could get the gum <laughs> at school. Mm-hmm. So I was hanging it. You know what I mean? So. Yep. It was it was cool. It was like something that I learned business wise at a young age. Yeah, dude, I, I have same kind of story. Um, a friend of mine actually gave me a giant like metal tin of like these chuba tube uh, or whatever you call them, these like sucker lollipop things. A friend of mine gave me mm-hmm. a giant uh, tin of those for Christmas or something, and I was like, I can't eat all this freaking candy, you know. So of course I went to school, and started selling them off, and I was like, oh, this is a gold mine. So. Of course, after that tin sold off, you know, I bought other tins and kept slinging them at school. So yeah, I, I came from the same kind of situation, man. That's funny. Nice. Uh, so you know, as you grew up and uh, became a pro rider, obviously you made good money through the contest scene, sponsors and endorsements and stuff. Um, so at that point, uh, how did you learn to manage that money, or did you have someone help you along the way? Any kind of managers or financial type guys helping you sort of figure out what to do with that money once you came into it? Um, yeah, like I, I had, well, for instance, like, my, like I said, my mom didn't make crazy money. She was a dealer at, at Valley's, um, my whole life growing up. So, uh, a blackjack dealer. So when I got a little money, I instantly got her out of the casino. So she went and she worked with me. Um, and now I hired her as my business manager because she was always really good with money. And I knew that if I hired her, 
at 22 or 3, whatever I was, that then she would not allow me to go buy Lamborghinis and Ferraris and shit, <laughs> mm-hmm. so that I would have a problem, you know, like, why why would I buy that crap? That's just to get chicks, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So she would be like, TJ, that, that's a little bit outrageous, like, you know, slow it down a little bit here, mm-hmm. slow it down a little bit there. And she would help me keep my head straight. And, and she let me buy, like, crazy things once in a while or maybe old cars or things like that that are just money in the bank, you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, old cars don't really cost you much. They, they you know, they're 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 a pain in the ass, and they, 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 they definitely break down. <laughs> but it's it's something that they look cool, they're awesome, but they don't go down in value too much, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's pretty awesome. And she, she kept me there, she kept me grounded, and she kept, she taught me that don't try not to buy things that go down in value. Mm-hmm. Try to buy things that go up in value, like homes and land and property. And you know, so that was something that I learned at a young age as well. And then my my old doctor that fixed my wrists and stuff and that helped me with broken bones and things. His name was Doctor Marone, and Doctor Marone sat in my living room for four hours and and was like giving me the college of of investing and not making mistakes and things like that. So he was telling me, no matter what, TJ, pay your house off. So that was everything that I had not learned at the time. You know, Mm -hmm. I was sitting on money in the bank instead of paying my house off because I thought that that was the right thing to do and the write offs and everything else. Well, at the end of the day, he's like, TJ, like, like the, the interest that you're paying on your house, and or the taxes that you're saving, if you're if you're saving money on by paying by not paying the tax guy, but you're spending the money on the interest, what difference does it make? And it really didn't resonate with me. I was like, uh, I don't understand. He's like, Is it in your wallet? Is it in your pocket? And I was like, No, not at all. So he's like, So what difference does it make if it's going to to bullets or interest? Because mm-hmm. taxes, you know, like because you, you don't know what they're doing with your taxes. They're just buying awesome, you know, airplanes and shit. So mm-hmm. so he's like, What do you want to, what do you want the money to go? Do you want it to go to the interest guy, the fat cat, or do you want it to go to the city? And I was like, Yeah, you know what, you're right. So might as well just pay the money, the dirty rotten taxes, and have your house owned outright. And I was like, Okay. So I, I that's that's the first thing that I did is I, I paid attention and I did that and that was the best move that I ever made in my life because it gave me peace of mind and it gave you gave me like uh, a little bit of power in the past. You mm-hmm. understand? Like so if 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 you if you just take everything that somebody gives you and you just take like get some deals and take you become a little bit um not valuable. You know, you're a little bit of a, a a prostitute of the industry, you know. Mm-hmm. Like if you, if you can't pass, if you can't pass up on an opportunity, then there's there's no power. So there's 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 a lot of power in the past. So that's that's what it gave me um, was was having a place that I I could live in for the rest of my life and be cool. It doesn't even matter. And that's that's what it gave me. And that was something that I've learned at an early age. And that's that's what I did. Is that the same house that you still live in now? Yep. Nice. Never moved. Wow, very cool. Um, so, uh, let's see. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, so, okay, so besides that house um, and, you know, sort of the, the stuff that your mom told you about not buying flashy cars and stuff right away, um, what were some of your early plans for kind of investing or, or saving your money to, to sort of set you up for success later in life? Well, I, I think it's, it's by losing, you know. It's like... By losing lots and lots of money is, is how I learned the most. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that's taught me a lot. And and you know, like I when I was 22 years old, I tried to start a limo, limousine company here in Vegas, and I had no idea that there was those crazy, you know, mafia limousine dudes and stuff like that that are that are that are not appreciative of you jumping into something half-assed and whatever happens happens. And I had no idea that it was it was such a big 
deal to jump into the limousine industry here in Las Vegas, and and it is. So hmm. so I learned that. I, I lost my ass on that, and and like I had to pay off a limousine and let my try to get try not to mess my credit up and all kinds of funny things that happened. Um, but it's it's something that I learned from. So I never got in the limousine business again. You know, I was like, okay, that's that's I learned. Mm-hmm. And then I got into a thing called Aspen Financial, which is like a, a thing that was paying us fourteen or I think it's fourteen or sixteen percent of our money. So I was buying that crazy because if you're going to buy pay me that for my money, and it's it's basically hard money loans that are unsecured. So it's it, it's it's First and second deeds of trust is what it's called. So you, you buy these first and second deeds of trust, and you get paid. And I was laughing, dude. I was like, man, I'm retired. Like, <laughs> I'm cool now because I was making so much money. But it turns out that not everybody is as, as concerned with their credit as you are. Mm-hmm. So they'll just default, and they'll just go out of bank, you know, go bankrupt. And you're done. Right. So, so, so basically, in this no situation, idea. sorry to cut you off. So, just I to be no clear, idea that, that was even possible, bro. I had no idea that somebody would just like spend their credit and not even worry about it. I, I had no idea that that was something that was possible, and it taught me, you know, and it, it cost me a pretty penny for sure. So, just but just it, so that I'm I'm hearing right. you clear, is this does this mean that you were basically loaning people money? So, like, you became the bank loan. Is that what you're talking about? Basically, but I was in I was in with a lot of heavy hitters from Las Vegas, mm-hmm. you know, and, it, and a lot of people got smoked on this, and it, it's it's something that you know we all were in. Like I, I looked at the list of names, there were some heavy hitters that I knew I knew their name here in Las Vegas, so so they were in it as well. But they could afford to lose that money a lot more than I could at the time. Mm-hmm. So it was something that was like just a little bit of you know cream off the top for them. They didn't care. They were like, yeah, whatever. We lost a little bit here, lost a little bit there. I was I was swimming with some pretty heavy fish, you know? Yeah. And, and and when you put a lot of your eggs in that basket and then it just falls over, you got to relearn it, you know? You got to learn, okay, that went wrong. <laughs> Let's just go this route. Then mm-hmm. go that route. So so really, this the, the, the advice that I have for anybody that is, is getting into the game and really trying to trying to, to make something happen is is I I first would do deals, try to do deals as best you can by yourself. So if you can if you can buy some land and and, and and do the deal yourself, do the due diligence yourself. Because on the property that I did the land myself and I really like paid attention and I learned some stuff, I made pretty heavy profits and, and it was awesome. And then on some of the stuff that I went and bought myself, like that, that I I didn't even have any partners in, I killed it. Mm-hmm. But then, like on some of the stuff that I let other people do due diligence on, and it were long shots, I didn't necessarily. I mean, I still own, you know, a few hundred acres in Arizona of sticker bushes. So <laughs> basically, you know, I'm gonna be t- paying taxes on that for a long time. I may I might have it. And give it to my daughter when she's old enough, and that, or something like that. It's cool, but mm-hmm. but it's something that you'll you know I'll never see that money really. I mean, it, it it's there, and maybe I could get sixty cents or seventy cents on the dollar right now if I wanted to to move it over now. But but I'm not. I'm I'm cool. I'll just chill on it for a while and just do it. But but you win some, you lose some, mm-hmm. and and I figure out that you win some, you lose most. If you if you don't do the due diligence yourself, hmm. that, that's a good way to put it. You win some, you lose most. If you don't do the work, yeah, I like that. And you really have to learn from your mistakes. If you don't learn anything, then it's a full loss. But mm-hmm. if you did learn, then it's basically you're paying for the education. So right. who cares? Yeah, no so, big deal. You so, know, you got to so, take it on the chin, man. You can't you can't like if you get smoked, you can't be like, oh man, I can't believe you did that to me. You know, mm-hmm. like to the to the Whoever's whoever's doing the smoking, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you did the due diligence, and you you tried to to make a move, and and that happens, man. That happens a lot a lot of times. 
So what kind of thing would you learn from, say, the limousine business that you could take over to, you know, another business like, you know, land deals or, or other businesses? Um, I'm sorry, say it again? So what type of lesson could you learn from, you know, making a mistake or losing money in a business like the limousine industry that you could then take over to somewhere else? Oh, okay. Well, well, I, I know for a fact that, that when you, when you have all that stuff, like what I learned from the limousine industry is when you get into a business, you really need to look at all the problems and all the expenses that come with it, not just the employees. So like, I was just worried about the employees because I didn't want anybody to not have a job. Mm -hmm. So I was like hiring a couple guys and and whatever, but I didn't realize that I had to pay payroll tax and payroll uh, insurance on all these guys and everything else. So that was something that was hurting our business as well. You know, mm -hmm. we, we had the payroll was not really out of control. I remember that was a little bit heavy. And then that's a cash business as well. So you had to worry about the skim. So when people were skimming money from you, and so you have to like account for that stuff before it happens. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was like always thinking that everybody was as honest as I was, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so you mentioned uh, briefly a company called Forgiven, and uh, that was the one that seems like it was launched pretty much right after you had gotten out of a coma or something, which I assume you had been working on it beforehand. So can you give me a little bit of the background of this company and kind of explain to people that might not know what it is? Yeah, Forgiven is an alcohol metabolizer, and uh, it's clinically proven to lower your blood alcohol level up to 50% in one hour. Wow. So we had, like, pretty heavy clinicals uh, a few Decembers ago, and I was just like, man, this is this is, this is is the next thing right here. And, and it, it, it's still going, and it's sustaining itself and everything else, but it's a very hard industry to break into. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that kind of stuff is, is really, really hard. And my partner, Chaz, is, is running it now, and he's doing it, and, and it's still going. Everything's going great. Cool. Um, but it's very hard to to make anything happen for real. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do, you know, the exit strategy is, is to have somebody come and try and buy it off of us, and that's it. You mm -hmm. know, like we don't want to run that and own it forever. Right. But the exit strategy is for for a Budweiser or somebody crazy to come in there and buy it from us, and yeah. that's it. Now that, and we're the first to market for sure because there's a lot of people out there now with with their different um, alcohol metabolizers that don't even know what to call it and don't even know what to do. They're, you know, they're, they're claiming the no hangover thing and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it's like, you can't really say that stuff. And I learned that you can't say that stuff and be in legal ramifications. You know, you can't mm -hmm. say that, you know, certain things you have to, you have to word things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You can't say certain things and can't claim certain things and be legal. Right. Um, backing up oh, a little bit, um, so how did this product come about? Because if I'm not mistaken, you don't even drink alcohol. No, I don't. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do no drugs. I don't do anything, anything like that. Um, I just think, uh, you know, it was a, my, my partner and I were sitting down, and he's like, I got this thing. And he told me about it. I said, all right, let's give it a shot. I mean, him and I, like, we got into a few business deals together different land deals and stuff like that. We made a lot of money together and then we lost a lot too. So we're, we're always taking shots. That's all you can do, you know? Yeah. And who is Just this guy exactly? Taking shots, man. Who, who is the I'm partner? Sorry? Can you describe that relationship and, and who, tell who oh, yeah, he is? His name is Chaz. His name is Chaz. He's a, a firefighter here in Vegas. And, and that was the very attractive to me is that like when I first met the guy, I made him and his buddies a few hundred grand each because we did a land deal here and that was when the land was going crazy in Vegas. Mm -hmm. So, so we became instant friends and I met a, a, a few other firefighters and that's kind of basically how the firefighter thing even came about, mm -hmm. like for real. So when you're talking other about the, uh, these types dreams. of land deals, uh, can you give me an example of a land deal that's uh, done well for you? Yeah. Like, I, I, for instance, I broke my wrist one time and there was a, a two and a half acre lot over here by Vegas in Vegas and right by my house kind of. And, uh, out here in the middle of the desert and two and a half acres. And I, I had a broken wrist, so I didn't have anything to do. And I did some due diligence on it. And I was like, man, this thing is going to be worth some money because 
I looked up on the, on the assessors, the county assessors map of what's going on, and that was before Southern Highlands was even made yet. So Southern Highlands is the whole community that's out here in Vegas, mm-hmm. like right here by my house. And they didn't have any targets out here. They didn't have any grocery stores or anything. So I knew the land was going to be worth something someday. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I said, okay, cool. And I, I, when I was riding my mountain bike at the time, because I had a broken wrist, so like to stay in shape, I was going to ride the mountain bike. And, and I, that gave me time to think. And when I was sitting there thinking, I was like, man, I got to ask my friend Vince, who built my house that I live in now, if he has any land for sale. That's what I'll do. So I stopped by his house on the way home. He said, yes, I have a two and a half acre lot right by your house. I'll sell it to you for 180 tomorrow. And he goes, and it'll be, re- it'll be really worth a lot of money someday. And I said, okay. So I, I took his word for it. And then I went home, do, did some due diligence, and then, and then did all the math. And I said, okay, cool, I'll take it. That night, I told him. Mm-hmm. So when I took it, I instantly put it up, put it up for sale. I was like, man, this is, this is going to be crazy. I'll put it up for sale for like 250 grand or something. And like, I'll make a lot of money off of it, you know, mm-hmm. from what I was, I thought was going to be a lot of money. So then <laughs> as it starts going up faster and faster, I'm like, man, what I'll do is I'll sell my house that I live in now. And then I'll have two and a half acres of trails. It's twice as big as what I have. Mm-hmm. So, it'll be huge. And then I went and got the blueprints for a new house and I was going to have this crazy 5,000 square foot house and it was going to be a $2 million project all said and done. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, man, like 2 million bucks. And I didn't even have the house that I live in now paid off yet. And I was thinking to myself, man, that's, I think I was 28, 28 or 29. And then, I was like, man, $2 million, or I could try and sell that property because the property started going crazy out here in Vegas. So I said, man, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see what I can go for. So I put it up for sale for a million dollars. And, and I already had it paid off because I was, I only already paid 180 for it. Mm -hmm. So, so now I put it up for sale for a million bucks because I'm like, man, I don't deserve to live in a $2 million house. I'm thinking that, you know, <laughs> uh, like, like uh, I'll be paying payments forever. And, and like, or I could just pay the house off that I live in now and be cool. Like, I would just rather do that. And the house I live in now is, is awesome. Mm-hmm. So why would I just want to do that? And then, uh, I put it up for sale. This lady came back and she said, I'll give you eight twenty five. And I said, sold. Nice. And that was it. And it was like in, in 2006, actually. Uh-huh. And, and uh, in January of 2006, I sold her that land for 825 And that was because I wasn't greedy. I wasn't like, I, I, I wasn't even close to greedy. I was just like, all right, I, like, I paid 180 for this land, and mm-hmm. I just made a lot of money off of it. Wow. So I probably should just sell me up, take the money, and bounce. Mm-hmm. So I did. And then, wouldn't you know it, in February of 2006, I'm watching the news, and they're like, the housing market's starting to level off here in Vegas. Uh, it's interesting. It's kind of weird. And then March, April, May, June, July, the housing market's leveled off. And then August, September, October, we started hitting that slump. Mm-hmm. And everybody started losing their money and then losing their assets. And I was like, oh, my God, I just sold that property in January. Wow. And now it's December. And... And and everything's going down. Yeah, and plumbing, and people are selling fire, selling stuff, and going crazy. And everybody was worried and scared. And man, it was crazy. So wow. that was a really good move. Yeah, damn, very cool. Um, so uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like one time I was at your house and you were mentioning possibly buying a strip club that was getting run down or something. Did that ever happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there was one. I got involved in that. That was a learning experience. We got robbed by a lawyer, actually. Oh shit. Um, yeah, that that was a, a learning experience. I didn't get anybody involved because I wasn't sure uh, that that it wasn't property. You know what I mean? Like land deals, I'll let anybody in that wants to. Like, if you want to send money and, and give give it a go, mm-hmm. like let's do it. But I'll always double whatever you're putting in, so I know that it's. 
I'm, I'm, I, my heart's in the right place. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So and if you lose money, at least I lost double. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that was kind of my rule back in the day. And then now, like with the strip club thing, it was, it was 25 grand. So it wasn't that heavy of a loss, but mm-hmm. it was, it was something that was like, I don't want to be a part of it. Cause I don't want that image. And I don't want that in my mind, but, but, Here's some money, and I, I I like money more than I don't like strippers. So right. let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, man. So, That's funny. So I sent it, but uh, yeah, we got smoked on that. Yeah. So you you just mentioned uh, putting up double money from other people, and uh, that was another thing I had heard you mention before was you know doing these land deals where you bring in other pro riders or other friends or whatever. And is that kind of coming from the same place of you just like to help people of like, hey, I find a deal, like, hey, let's try to make some of my buddies some extra money. So that 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 fully comes from that. Like I, when I made that money, like on that two and a half acre lot, I was like, man, I really got to get Fuzzy involved because there was a property right next door to it, and I was trying to talk him into to buying that property right next door to it. It's two and a half acres as well, but it was for a hundred and ninety thousand instead of a hundred and eighty. Mm-hmm. And I told him that I would split that property with him if if he bought it. If it, like just to make it less for him, mm-hmm. and I would suck up the next extra ten grand. I, I told him I would make it. I would I would eat that ten grand, and I'll sell you half of the the property for one eighty. Mm-hmm. Like so, so you get nine. You you come up with ninety grand, and I'll make you fifty percent partner of a one ninety property. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "All right, lads, all right." And he went home, and then he thought about it, and then he he didn't do it, and then all of a sudden I sold that land for eight twenty five. Wow. We could have sold a five five acre lot for well over you know probably two million dollars mm-hmm. for five days you know like because if, if it was like a block like that we could have made some money but wow but we you know we live and learn but but that was a shot that we took but at the same time you know there was another hundred acres out in phoenix that we were still sitting on but i had to make some very very heavy moves to try and keep everybody's money involved and try and keep everybody's um, interest still good, um, and not everybody paying their asses off to try and keep that land, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was a bad deal, and it still is. It still sucks, but you win some, you lose some. Yep. Um, you know, I and mean, hopefully one day we'll be able to get some of our money back and be good on it, or if, if we all sit on it long enough, um, I don't know how it's going to work out, but hopefully it'll be good. Yeah. And, and, and the thing that sucks is I'm stuck paying the taxes on that stuff, you know what I mean? Because I don't want to, like, I don't foreclose on my friends. So mm-hmm. this is what it is. Wow. So, man, we've already talked about land deals. We've talked about a limousine business. We've talked about a strip club, you know, uh, <laughs> these other, like, bank loan kind of things. Uh, forgiven, you know, a product-type company. Uh, are there any other type of stuff that we've we've left off that you've had your hand in? It seems like you just do so much stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely touched it all. Like, uh, I uh, right now I own a, a clothing company with a friend of mine named Uriah Faber mm-hmm. and Scott James. Um, Scott James comes from the um, supplement industry. He uh, he started a company called BSN, and BSN supplements are a pretty big deal. Mm-hmm. And he, he sold that, and then he wanted to get into a clothing line. And so he called Uriah Faber, who's a friend of mine, and then Uriah called me. So you get me and Uriah and Scott now have this company um, called Torque. Mm-hmm. So so Torque is doing great. We have fighters and stuff in the UFC, and we have we have BMX riders now and and fighters, and and we're we're just blowing the company up, man. We're really trying to make it happen. Yeah, and it's something that I've always wanted to do, and and it's something that I never had any kind of points on or any kind of power at all. Mm-hmm to have like like we started uh helping out other clothing companies that wanted to get into action sports and they just they just basically you know pulled the plug at some point you know right they just pulled the plug and there's nothing we could do about it yeah so that sucked so especially because i had a lot of people involved you know trying to help mm-hmm. and now now i said you know i won't get involved with another one until, unless i own it unless i'm partners mm-hmm. like i can't be I can't be putting my name out there. Just, just whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Very cool. So 
Let's talk about the multiple income streams. So you've got the business stuff, you've got your investments, um, you know, you've got the, the TV hosting gigs with the MTV shows. Can you sort of break down a pie chart for me of where your income these days comes from? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, like I think, uh, I think the majority of my income probably comes from, from MTV stuff or television appearances. Um, sometimes I do club appearances, like they'll fly me across the country and, and, Paying a bunch of money to go to a nightclub is stupid, <laughs> and, and I, I, I don't I don't go to nightclubs like so so it makes it more valuable because I don't go to nightclubs. Yeah. So it, it's awesome, <laughs> and then uh, or a pool party or something. You know, it's, it's cool. Mm-hmm. It, it's not like crazy money or anything, but it's pretty good. You know, yeah. so I I, uh, I I do that for for a little little money here and there. Like I could buy a, a, an old school Bronco or something. Like that, <laughs> you know. And, and so, so, like all my hobbies and stuff like that. And then, um, I'm still I'll ride for Monster for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, that's you know, Monster Energy is, is is I was like I think I was their first BMX rider. Mm. So it was pretty cool. And I think that they, I know that they really um, respect that, and they're re- very very nostalgic when it comes to that stuff. Like like Rodney Sachs, who owned the thing outright and was just really a sweetheart of a guy. Um, I love him. He, he told me like, you're our guy, like you're, you're part of the monster family for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's something that I'll never leave. Um, torque pays me pretty good still. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's going great. Um, torque is, is, it's really a good company. And I think we have a lot of, of things on the horizon as well, mm-hmm. you know? And then getting in bed with somebody as smart as Scott James, who is such a brilliant businessman, is is never a mistake, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, like somebody that knows more than you, that's for damn sure. So yeah. Very you just cool. have to sit back and let him do his thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Uh, I guess I, for some reason, I totally slipped my mind that uh, you still had endorsements like monster and stuff too. So that's cool that they, uh, you know, have been loyal and stood by you, um, th- all these years. Yeah. They're the only company that I still have that for BMX, you know, mm-hmm. mostly for BMX only, you know, like I, I, that's why I plug them on everything I do. Yeah. And I always try to help them out whenever I can, but they're really not looking for that. You know what I mean? They're, they're, it's more of a loyalty thing with them. Like they, they, they like me to be at appearances, certain appearances. Like we did the um, Austin thing, and we went to Austin and we made an appearance and we checked them out and, and they, they had me there. It was cool, mm-hmm. you know. It was fun. The Empire BMX, which was awesome. I always wanted to go there anyway, so it was cool. And then there was just like very, very good vibes. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, so we're gonna start wrapping up here. I kind of have one more business type question to, uh, to sort of tidy up this package and put a bow on it. Um, so obviously, you know, we talked about your, your business guy, you're an investor, um, and you like to help people. Um, so can you explain how your wealth or, or your financial success has affected your life in positive ways besides being able to, you know, buy the cool cars and stuff? And I sort of assume this is going to come back to helping people of some, some kind, but, uh, you know, go ahead and fill me in on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Listen, being you know having money is, is all well and good if you want to have fancy cars and whatever else. Like, I, I don't necessarily need that stuff, so I don't have a lot of uh, you know any kind of high end Mercedes and high end Ferrari or anything like that. I don't have any of that. So it, I would rather spend that money on the single mom that's trying to get her gas uh, at the pump, and I see her. I just go fill a tank up. Like that's something that I would rather do with mm-hmm. my money if, if if it's possible. It's called Random Acts of Kindness Everywhere. So my friend Ricky Smith started this company called Rake, and so I sit on the board for that now. And it's it's a uh, Random Acts of Kindness Everywhere. We we do things like filling up people's tanks of gas, buying people's groceries in front and back of us in line. Um, whatever happens at, at the time. I I feel like helping or taking care of, I do. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm around and I see somebody that's a little bit difficult, like having a hard time or whatever, I feel like they're not, they're not like having the best day, I'll buy them breakfast. If I see them, you know, at Stacking Oaks, I'll, I'll, I'll buy them breakfast. 
if I see somebody walking across the parking lot while while I'm eating breakfast at Stacks, I'll 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 go take the coffee mug out there and and fill up their coffee. You know, like this bum that, that walks across it with a shopping cart, he walks across the parking lot, and I filled his coffee up a hundred times. Mm-hmm. And I've tried to get him to quit smoking, but he won't. <laughs> and it's it's like it's like man, I really try just to make the world a better place than I found it. Yeah. Damn, an inspiration to us all, man. That's that's so cool. Um, so we're gonna wrap up with uh, a few quick hit questions, and these uh, you can hit, talk a little bit longer if you want, but uh, you know if you have short answers, that's fine too. Uh, and these are questions I like to ask pretty much all my guests, uh, just because I find it um, super interesting to hear different people's takes on the same set of questions. Um, so, have you okay. had any mentors throughout your life? And if so, can you tell me about that relationship? Oh, yes. Uh, I've had a lot of mentors in my life. Uh, one of them is Travis Chiprez, and he he was a pro BMXer. And so in my BMX days, like he would, he would like, help me in the competitions and stuff like that. And I probably owe him for all the gold medals and all, all the medals, really, I have and things like that. Like, he's been there and has helped me and changed my flats and he- helped me fix my bikes and, and whatever else you could, you could say. But he's also helped me keep my head straight and keep level-headed. Like if, if I got a little bit big-headed or something on something, he would, he would check me. And that was a very nice thing. Um, Tracer Finn has always been a, a, a solid mentor for me. Uh, he's another old-school BMX guy. Um, he's, he's helped me a lot. But the number one um, mentor I think that I've ever had is probably Nick Herta who owned an appliance store here in Vegas, and he gave me my sense of style, a sense of, of people skills, and trying to help people and trying to be a nice guy and do the right thing. He is the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily for law-wise. Like, he definitely cut sick on the law with, with, with speeding and blowing stop signs. But he was, the, he was the friendliest, nicest, most personable guy I've ever seen in my life, and I always wanted to be like him. Very cool. Um, how do you decompress? I play piano. Um, I, I think that's a very big thing for me. I, I, like, if I don't play piano for a long, long time, then I start getting a little bit antsy, you know, ready to go. So it's definitely an outlet for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the first things I ever bought, and I still have it today. And it's this baby grand piano. I never, I never um, not play it. I play it pretty much every day. Nice. Have you and Scotty Kramer ever had a piano jam session together? Yes, a little bit. Um, just just for like a couple seconds here or there, but I really enjoy Scotty Kramer. I love that guy. He'll send me a message every now and then of him singing a new song and blasting out something, and mm-hmm. I just think it's so cool. Uh, he's he's the best, man. I, I recently had the opportunity to go to New Jersey and shoot uh, photos with him for a couple of days for Fox, uh, his clothing sponsor, and uh, he's just such a, such a good, nice guy, and... Uh, yeah, he, he blasts on the piano, man. And I know you guys are monster uh, energy teammates, too. So uh, maybe maybe yeah, one day you guys sure. can uh, record a little jam session. It's funny, though, because he doesn't actually put out any of his music. Like, he, he keeps it so secret and private. Um, yeah, I do, too, man. I, I, I have a few things out there that leaked on the Internet or that we put out, you know, back in the day. But, mm-hmm. but it's, it's vi- I mean, I have hundreds of songs that are still in the lab. You know, they're just on their lock and key, and they're there. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, can you tell me about a time in your life when you've been at your breaking point, um, either mentally or physically, just kind of at your breaking point of complete exhaustion? Uh, yeah, I mean, for for exhaustion when it comes to to working out wise, that was on my honeymoon. We we did a triathlon, uh, an Olympic triathlon in Kona. And I didn't even train for it at all. Mm. I just sent it. And that's something that I regret right now that I've never trained at all or anything and just sent it with my wife. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, man, okay, that was, that was my breaking point for sure um, for that. But, but as far as like mentally, you know, things like that, like we've had some pretty long shoots um, at MTV for 17, 18 hour days sometimes. But you just have to remember, like that guy's carrying the camera this long or mm-hmm. that guy's doing that long and you're just a dude like you don't even do you don't do nothing mm-hmm. so something up about it you know what i mean so that's happened um i i me- mentally got 
just about got broken mentally when it was came to, to passing the National Registry Test for EMT, hmm. which was really hard for me because the National Registry Test is really a, a mess a mess of a test, man. It's, it's, you have no idea which answer is correct because some answers have three correct answers. It's just which one is the best. Mm -hmm. It was very hard, very difficult. So, um, I had to, I had to take extra time and study it for six hours a day for an entire month. Wow. So can you tell me when you get, uh, hit by inspiration or ideas the most? Probably driving in my car, um, listening to the radio is, is, is when I get hit with, with the most. I, 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 I really just, that, that, that's for music. Um, that, that's like, oh, oh, I can play that, or I can do that, or I should do that, or I should try that. And that's something that, that has always inspired me. Mm -hmm. um, right now, musically, Yellow Wolf is really inspiring me. Like, that guy is just, he's dialed. So um, I love his music um i think that business-wise and 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 most other life-wise i get hit with inspiration at two or three in the morning that <laughs> sucks because i wake right up right put the robe on go in the living room <laughs> <laughs> cool um and last but not least do you have a favorite quote or a piece of advice that someone has given you um i mean one of the one of the best advices that i, I ever had it was a book and the title was Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. And that book was given to me by Tracer Finn, actually. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and ever since then, everything that happens in my life, it just keeps on resonating. And I'm like, man, this is even better. This is even better. That, that is even better. Mm -hmm. And because everything in my life now, since 2006, 2007, has resonated with Stephen Murray. Mm. So... So, like, 06 was my dad died in October, then Stephen Murray was in June of 07. Mm -hmm. And I, I, everything in the world I can't believe is that, that, like, when I broke my leg and I had two, two bones sticking out of my leg, I, I, I remember thinking to myself, a year from now, this isn't going to matter. Mm -hmm. And at least, at least I'll be able to rehab and make it better. Mm -hmm. And I just was thinking, like, well, my dad died last year, and then Stephen Murray, just got wrecked in June, and, and then, you know, I mean, and I have a broken leg. My dog got out, got hit by a car right there in front of me. I was like, all right, it's all small stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I kept thinking. And it, that, that sucks because, it, you know, that, that you, you become a little bit more of a hard person, but at the, at the same time, life is rough, man. Like, mm -hmm. if you've, you've had any kind of tragedies in your life or anything like that, like, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I actually uh, wrote the exact same thing down, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty stoked that you said that um, because you posted something on probably Instagram or something um, probably a couple years ago now about that book. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I looked it up, and you know, on Amazon you can buy a book for a couple bucks used, and I, I ordered that book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and I'm not a, a huge reader. At certain points in my life, I've tried to make myself read, and it's really tough for me. Um, but this yeah, book is, is very small, and it's very easily di to digest. So, you know, I'm obviously saying this more for the listeners as opposed to you, TJ. But the, this book is like a ton of small chapters that are like a page and a half each um, or less of just like small little nuggets that just can hit home. You can open to any page at any day of the week and just read one of these little chapters, and it just hits home, and it helps – put things into perspective. And this book had a huge impact on my life as well, as far as helping me to kind of just, just stay calm. You know what I mean? And, and don't sweat the small stuff. Um, and yep. my dad, I uh, hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this. Sorry, dad. But at, at a certain point, um, after I read this book, my dad was struggling with a little bit of anxiety issues and I mentioned it to him. And then, uh, I went ahead and ordered it and had it sent to his house off of Amazon. Um, and he got a lot out of it as well. Um, and so I recommend this book to anybody and everybody. And of course, I'll link this um, in the show notes so you guys could go check it out. But yeah, it's just a, a great, great little just book that uh, that just has a lot of good information in it. Yeah, man. That's, that's awesome. Um, great. I think that's a good point to end it on. Um, so TJ, can you go ahead and tell people where they can find you online, either your social networks or any other websites you want to plug? Um, I'm just at TJ Lavin. 
on everything. So and I'm at TJ Lavin, so that's that's it. No no dots, no nothing. Just, just cool. straight up. And then uh you know, we have torque one dot net. Um that's that's our website for, for Torque and, and I think that's pretty badass. And then uh you know and me and your eye are just gonna keep that thing going and keep it going big. Awesome. Uh, well, I'll, we'll link to those in the show notes as well. And of course, you guys can all follow me on my social networks at Fat Tony BMX. And you can go to the uh, podcast website at theexpansionprojectpodcast.com. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got some affiliate links. We've got your NutraSuma coupon code for 20% off of your protein and supplements. We've got 15% off of Chef Kate's nut butter. She's got some really delicious stuff on her site. And of course, we've got the Amazon affiliate link. And uh, that is going to kick back a little bit of money to the show, but it won't cost you anything extra. So if you guys got something out of this, which I imagine everybody got some kind of inspiration or motivation out of this episode, please remember to tell a friend, subscribe either on iTunes or Stitcher so you don't miss any other episodes, and go to the iTunes page, leave a five-star rating, and leave us a review. Um, And until next episode, I'm Fat Tony, and thank you, TJ Lavin, so much for joining me. This has been absolutely amazing. No problem at all, man. Thanks for having me.